think we can now start. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexey. Uh, I'm working in Adiax, uh, and the, this presentation is about how to uh, create a mutable uh, infrastructure for continuous delivery. So we are going to start with Alexander, who is the second speaker. Um, I'm going to just dis discuss with you about some uh, theory, and then we'll go into show you some examples, and if we will have time, Alexander can, can do a live demo about what exactly is all about. Um, so let me again introduce myself. Uh, I'm a pro program manager in Ajax, so I'm managing different kind of projects, uh, and one of the scopes of my tasks are also the continuous integration, continuous delivery for some of the largest corporates, corporate accounts. Uh, so what, what we're presenting here is actually uh, we are doing day-to-day -day life. Okay, so let's start with some theory. Uh, hopefully, after lunch, people are not so sleepy. Um, so what exactly are we speaking about? We're speaking about the infrastructure uh, as the code. Uh, we, this is, as you can see, this is an approach to define the infrastructure uh, using the normal paradigm of a developer. So this is, very, this is something that most of the developers are getting into right now because the projects are becoming bigger, um, lots of people starting to uh, think out of the box. It's not only Drupal out there, you have lots of different things around. Uh, so, uh, and this is a very familiar approach for the developers. So developer gets, getting used to write some code and uh, lots of people are trying to stop using Bash because this is like the worst way of uh, configuring stuff on the server. Uh, so why infrastructure as a code? Uh, that's, that's quite obvious. Uh, most of the people want actually to uh, restart and recreate your infrastructure from scratch whenever they want. So when, for example, you have a problem somewhere uh, and uh, you, for example, you got hacked and you need to restart, restart directly, you can to do a total wipe out of the system and that's kind of a, a core value of all of that. So you know that everything you do can be easily automated. We prefer to use Git as a single source of truth. So everything, you will see that in the presentation later, but everything we do is everything, all, always in Git. Why? Because it's kind of a standard now, right? We are trying to save everything, code of the projects, the code of the system, and uh, the whole infrastructure is also in Git. Uh, as a developers, we like to treat everything as a code. That's, like a, that's how our head works. And again, uh, we want to replicate the component uh, whenever we want. This is quite useful in our scope because we are a digital agency and we doing some repeatable work for different clients. So this is how we save time. So what are the goals of the infrastructure? Uh, we want to people to change a lot and uh, improve the system a lot. We want, we want them to uh, not have a stress, don't be stressed about that. Uh, most of the people want to deploy on Fridays. Most of the people want to uh, change uh, everything right now, not waiting for some release window which happens in two weeks. Um, and uh, you want your developers to be more autonomous, more uh, proactive in all the, all the things which are, uh, which are the projects you're working on. So we actually don't really like when developer is blocked by something, by the environment which is not working, by, by everything like that, this is not cool. We think that this is also a part of the developer time. So what are the challenges right now? This is actually the, the, one of the first world problems. Right now, everything is so easy. You can start a droplet in DigitalOcean, Amazon's web services, Microsoft Azure. Everything is so available, so you give, it, you give this access to all your team. Uh, and now a team can start, create servers, start environment, etc. But the problem is that it's too fast. You cannot control it anymore. And you need to make sure that your infrastructure stays the same, that it's still secure, that people can use it over time. Uh, that's one of the problems you probably are already aware. So when, at some point of time, your server, your infrastructure have some uh, configuration done, and it's working. You know, most of the people say, if it's working, do not touch it. 
you probably started already with some automation. You have some chef recipe or Ansible script, whatever. And at some point, someone decided to, to, to do a hotfix. Something is broken on the in production environment, and he writes directly on the server, change it, and now your automation is gone. So that's, this is configuration drift. You, can, you cannot see the difference. The Snowflake servers. This is one is quite uh, problematic because this is, again, it's the same problem. People don't want to touch what's working. Uh, and sometimes, the snow, why we say Snowflake? Because it's, there is no Snowflake alike. So every server is different. Uh, and we don't want that. And the fragile infrastructure. This one is kind of a, a usual problem for uh, over busy people because they think that infrastructure is something that is like, like water. You don't have to do anything. It just works, but, but it's not. Uh, and there are a lot of stories about that. Uh, it's some, in some companies, in one of the companies, they had a server somewhere in the corner running uh, something. Nobody actually knows what's there. And in, in, two, or three, in two or three years, people starting to ask what is the server actually doing because most of the people who were working on that, they are not in the company anymore. So they, they decided to test and just unplugged it and whole infrastructure crashed. So they plugged it in again and never touched, like, touched it again. So this is like the main problem. You want to understand what's happening. This, this is why we say you must use Git for everything. Uh, you have history in Git. You, you know exactly what's happening. If someone is changing the server, just force them to use the version control for all the configuration everywhere. And again, uh, this is what I'm just, uh, what I just talking, speaking about. Uh, when your server is inconsistent, you have this kind of a circle which never ends. You don't know what to do. You have to use the ECN. If you now launch your Ansible script, it will probably break something or not. You don't know, so, this, so you don't touch it anymore. That's a challenge. And of course, the entropy erosion. Uh, why? Uh, when, let's say, let's give you a quick example. If you speak about Jenkins. Jenkins is uh, something that we use a lot. We think that's a great and powerful tool. But if at some point you forgot to, up to, up to upgrade it, in two years, it's impossible to do anything because it goes so fast. Uh, you, need, you need to do it much, much more, uh, in, in a much more consistent way and regularly. So what are the principles of the infrastructure in the code? The main thing, systems can be easily reproduced. So whenever you want, whatever you want, you have your script, it's in the code, it's in the history, you can launch it and you have your system exactly as you want it. You can dispose every system. This is very important. We think this is, this is most of the people, most of the people are scared about that. They don't want to destroy servers. They know that, oh, what's wrong? Okay. Uh, so yeah, systems can be disposable. You can destroy it and launch it again. It's not a problem. Uh, we will show it later. If you are using, we are using Docker a lot. Uh, we can destroy containers, start containers again. We have that data storage just for the data. So we don't, we don't really care about the server. The server is something that, that exists for 10 minutes or for 10 days. We don't care. Systems are consistent. You are, everything is inside the code, so it should be consistent. And the processes are repeatable. Again, this is like, like very important for, uh, pr there are many very important principles of the code. Uh, you must be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want, and it must be consistent. So we don't configure anything manually on the servers. I think last time we configured something on the server was probably two or three years ago. Everything is automated and inside Ansible or some, something like that. And the changes are welcome. So, what are, the what are the general practices of infrastructure as a code? Most of the time, you want some kind of a definition somewhere. So this is what you store in the code, are defini definition files. We'll speak with the, about the tools later. For example, the Terraform, which we are using a lot, uh, stores configuration in the files. So there is kind of a definition which explains what is going to be installed. We use Git. Whenever you do something, we actually encourage everyone to use the continuous integration, continuous delivery system. Changes are very frequent. You want people to be able to deploy whenever they want. You don't want to be locked on some particular knowledge of some, some particular guy in your company. So you, want, you must, must make sure that everything is, in, uh, is continuously integrated and delivered. 
So incremental changes. Some people prefer to, to create a big batch of something and then deploy it. Uh, and most of the corporate clients actually works on, work only like that because they want it to be uh, predictable, which is good from one, one, one side, but from another side, you can break things. And we actually encourage people to do in incremental updates. So with small changes, you update your infrastructure, don't do a big, uh, don't do big updates. And the continuous improvement. You must regularly update Jenkins. You must regularly update the tools you use. You must regularly think about what you are actually doing with your system, how it's deployed. Try to store, save some KPIs. How much, how many deploy, deployments you do per day? How many developers are working with your system? What is the average time of deployment? Everything like that must be analyzed, uh, and uh, it must be continuously improved. If you see at some point that people do not use it, the system as it's designed, why, it, why you build it? So that's a list of tools uh, we use a lot, and uh, this uh, a big part of the presentation for, for Alexander. Uh, we uh, use all of that. I'm not going to uh, explain about all of them. Uh, the main thing, the Jenkins, we think that it's very powerful. It's, it's going fast. It has now a very beautiful new blue, blue ocean interface. So if you never looked at that, have a look. Uh, we use GitLab uh, because GitLab we think it's an amazing piece of software. It's, uh, it goes very fast. It's, uh, it allows you to install it on your server and you do whatever you want with it. Uh, but it can be, of course, any, anything like that. GitHub, Bitbucket. Whenever there are the way of set up, setting up a hook in Git, you can use that. And of course, Docker, because we want everything to be disposable and, and launched whenever we want that. We are big fans of using HashiCorp uh, tools. They have, they have an amazing list of things, uh, but most of but what we have is Packer to, you know, the, to pack the, uh, this, the images for, uh, for your containers. The Terraform, this is the biggest part of the, of the whole structure because this is exactly where you describe your infrastructure in, in the way of code. And the console, because you need, you need to uh, do a service discovery, you need to define your services to make sure that all of them are working in the way you want. Ansible, and I think in 2017, lots of people know already about that. That's the way to automate things, to, to launch uh, server provisioning. The Kubernetes, because we don't, we don't have only one, one Docker image, we have lots of them, and we want to make sure that for all, any amount of, of uh, containers, we can manage and orchestrate them. And the Helm, that's a package, package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, so now, we are going to, 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 to show you how to actually uh, write and build the delivery pipelines because we all we actually think that uh, you have you want your websites or whatever application you're working on to be uh, to be continuously delivered. And but what about the continuous delivery of the continuous delivery tool you use? This is most of the time people don't think really about that. And in lots of examples, uh, when we were working with different clients. Uh, they have some kind of a tool. They have a, a continuous integration system with Jenkins, with some code inside. Uh, but the whole, the actual system which, which delivers things is a snowflake server. No one actually knows what's happening there. It's a Jenkins, some, some manually created jobs, some manually created pipelines, and uh, the guy who was actually uh, configuring them left already the company. So no one knows what's happening. So we want to the whole system starting from the application to the, to the continuous delivery tool to be inside the code. And I leave Alexander to continue the presentation. Thank you, Alexey. Uh, my name is Alexander. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our practical part of the presentation. Uh, the biggest issue with this presentation was uh, how to choose the right material because we wanted to show too many things and uh, it's not likely to be going go well with format of this presentation so i'm going to go into the core issue of uh, what alexey already mentioned of uh, continuous delivering the continuous delivery system itself uh, to i want to go to what is continuous delivery is uh, very quickly. Uh, 
is a software engineer approach in which teams produce software in short cycles, ensuring that the software can be reliably released at any time. Fast uh, releases, testing, and uh, reducing the cost time and the risk of delivering changes uh, because updates are incremental. Our continuous delivery system. Uh, we have this system to handle uh, lots of different projects. Uh, we have many instances of this uh, continuous delivery system and some of them are installed on the client side. And uh, we want to apply the same principles that we use to deliver projects to clients, to deliver our system to the servers we use. And uh, how we do it? Uh, who will continue to deliver the continuous delivery system? Because uh, why this question appeared? Because at some point, we can create continuous delivery systems that will create our continuous delivery system, but who will create this continu new continuous delivery system? Uh, this is endless uh, circle, and we came to the idea of beware, here be dragons, of our boros. Our boros is an ancient symbol showing the serpent or dragon that eats its own tail. It uh, is a symbol of infinity and infinity is our continuous delivery. And the nature's endless creation, we create resources, for example, on Terraform, and destruction. Systems are disposable and we can destruct any component at any time. So uh, I'm going to go to the practical part now and uh, show how we create the our continuous delivery system from the scratch, and we have a milestone zero, where we have nothing except our local environment and some repository on GitHub. And now we're going to create everything. I'll be switching uh, to console now, to make sure that we have nothing, I'll go to the Kubernetes and we will create the root environment and Kubernetes. I'm going to check that I don't have continuous delivery system installed. I'm checking and only have the console. Console also should be managed, but it will be not showed in this presentation how we create it, but it's very simple. You see the step one, where I execute, uh, create the Kubernetes cluster. I will skip this one because it takes too much time. Then I create the secrets. Secrets are just uh, some passwords or tokens or IDRSA keys uh, to keep them secret, of course. And I need to create them first before I can pull some repo and execute some steps because we need the secrets to access our external resources. I'll call the repo. I can share the repo after the presentation if anybody interested. And I executed the install command for Helm. Helm is the deployment manager for Kubernetes. It makes life so simple because I can do whole Kubernetes deployments with one command. Now I'm going to wait a bit and while uh, it's creating, we can check it on Kubernetes dashboard, what's happening. We can see that uh, some red messages appeared and uh, it's because some resources are not visible to each other yet and uh, it will be okay soon. And uh, I can show the Helm config while it creates. It's something like that. It has one file to define the chart with name and version. And then it has config map where it basically defines some files that uh, will be used to create Jenkins in our case uh, and some 
init scripts and property files that will be used to provide Jenkins with its variables and properties. Okay, commons is finished, and we can see that uh, uh, we have some uh, information here, and I want to check the logs, what was created. For this, I execute the describe pods command and check the name. Then check the logs for what is this name. I can see that something is happening now. In its script for Jenkins are executed. Some tokens created. The sage cage copied into the workspace. And now it says that Jenkins is fully up and running. So we can check if it actually works. Around the status command to check the services IP address external so I can access the Jenkins. This is newly created Jenkins, uh, but it already have our LDAP uh, working, so I will authenticate with our LDAP. And now we are at milestone one, the seed, where Jenkins is created and we're ready to create a jobs inside the Jenkins. For this uh, step, we have a concept of mothership seed job. Mothership means uh, it can create many projects and um, jobs for these projects, and uh, it depends on some repo where we define how this project looks. Now I'm going to execute this mothership uh, job and it will create the projects. Uh, this step should be automated too because we want to automate everything we do. Uh, but for this presentation, we keep it as, as it is because uh, otherwise it will be already created everything and I wanted to show you the process itself. While it's working, I'll show you the mothership config, how it's working. The main file on config is a list of projects, and uh, for this project, we use only one CI CD because we uh, want to create only CI CD based jobs on this Jenkins. Let's check the job is finished, and I can see that new folder appeared with the name of our project, and there is a seed job inside this project as well, and this seed job will create the project jobs and for every project, we will have the same seed job that will create everything, every job related for this project. This just, I just executed these steps. Again, seed pipeline means that it creates another jobs and pipelines. Now, 
when the job will be finished, we will be at milestone two, the root. Uh, we call this Jenkins server that we just created the root environment because it will create other infrastructure elements, other Jenkins servers, etc. Let's check what's happening here. Okay, job is finished. And when we return to the folder, we can see that some new folders and jobs were created. If we check some of them, we'll see that it has inside some jobs like apply, destroy, and poem. It corresponds to the Terraform actions that could be performed with the infrastructure. And at this point, we can actually see how we can do updates to the, our infrastructure and how it will be uh, handled by the root Jenkins server. It will create the, all the needed infrastructure components needed. Let me show it. At this point, I want to push some commit to our infrastructure repo, and then create a match request in GitLab for this commit. Assign the to me and submit match request. At this point, our new Jenkins server is already able to pick up this uh, event from the GitLab because while, when we created the Jenkins, it already provides and created web hooks on the GitLab site that uh, uh, triggers on every event like pushes, match requests, etc. triggers jobs on the Jenkins server. And now we can see that match request apply job is in progress. I believe I'll switch to video format now because uh, it takes some time to finish. I believe we can do it uh, faster with video. You can see that pipeline uh, job was launched for the merge request, for new merge request, and it executes some actions inside, like uh, installing Jenkins server uh, after we provide the configuration server with Terraform. You can see now the Ansible uh, tasks executed and uh, you can see that pipeline itself defined on the screen. And uh, it will go to the, I believe, to the Ansible configuration, so you can see the steps that you form. You can see the Docker Compose file used with uh, data volume and uh, master image. You can see the uh, Docker file for this image that we use. It's based on the Alpine Jenkins. I'll fast forward a bit. And uh, at this point, uh, the Jenkins is installed with the uh, Ansible and Docker on the merge request disposable environment. And uh, I just can copy this address and uh, check 
if the new server was actually created. Now you see the brand new Jenkins server created only for testing the match request I just created. And I'll perform the same steps to log in because our every Jenkins server is configured the same way. And we can see that uh, some jobs are already executed. And this execution was triggered from our root Jenkins environment. I will fast forward a bit. Now we can see the actual actions performed during our pipeline build. It's our custom system based on the YAO configuration format. We call it Zebra inside. And now you see the GitHub uh, repo uh, that has all the actions, all the actions logic inside. It's open source, so you can check how it works. I'm going to return to our presentation now. We just saw how these steps were performed and I'll just recap the steps because it was a bit messy. We create a merge request for master branch in our infrastructure repo in GitLab. And then it triggered through the GitLab webhook our match request apply job on nth environment root. And uh, the first step was Terraform apply that created our master and slave Jenkins servers for match request environment. Here you can see the pipeline defined with the blocks, and these blocks are the main stages of the pipeline. This is the definition of the block. As you can see, we use uh, Docker images for each block, and each block is executed in its own container. At each block has some stage defined with some actions inside each stage. And there you can see the actual logic how action is executed. Here you can see some Terraform config. Here we have a provider. We use console as the external storage of data because uh, we want to be able to execute Terraform commands from any Jenkins or from local PC, and it will not recreate the same environment each time. So we needed some external database, and we use console for that as a remote state storage. And you can see that we have two resources here uh, for master Jenkins and for slave Jenkins. It used the pre-baked uh, droplets on the digital ocean, and these pre-baked droplets were created with the packer that Alexei already mentioned today. Uh, it uh, packs the all ne needed software into the image, and then it could, could be easily and faster reused. Next steps, Jenkins was installed with Ansible, and then we performed some automated tests on Jenkins to make sure it works with the new changes. 
for now test consists of two steps, mothership set job creation and project set jobs creation. After that we accept automatically the merge request on the GitHub site. And after that we destroy our disposable environment, merge request environment. After that uh, we have automatically updated our master branch with the merge request accepted and the new stable take created to make sure we can follow the history of the releases and when stable take is created it triggers apply job the same apply job but it's this time for pre prot environment that already uh, should be run and uh, it's just the same and use same process. There are from apply, Jenkins install if needed, and Jenkins test. Now we have a milestone three called the tree, where we have a tree of Jenkins servers as much as we need it, and uh, each of them could have its own environments like dev, stage, pre prod, prod. Other actions. If you remember, I started with question: Who will create the delivery system itself? And I created from my local environment with some commands. At this point, we want to move these actions into the pipeline itself and make sure it could be executed from any Jenkins server that, that we already created. And when we perform it, we have a milestone, final, our final milestone, the circle. When the circle is completed and we can create the Jenkins server for any environment, from any Jenkins server. And uh, we cannot hear other different actions like be able to perform a health checks for all the infrastructure, etc. And we can add it, uh, these steps as needed. I believe I can skip the technical details of, for example, Packer configuration or Terraform configuration because everything is available on the internet on Google. It can be easily Googled and I wanted to share our experience how we integrate these uh, technologies and tools to have what we have. Again, the core idea of the system is to have everything in code and we have mothership config repos that contains links to some projects and every project have a link on project repo and each project repo defines its pipelines and configuration. And everything is created in hierarchy from top level and descending to lower levels. This is some high level overview of pipelines. Uh, we already see some parts of that. And main idea here that we have pipelines for each environment and uh, uh, everything is shared through the console and Parker provides images for Terraform. I believe we can skip this part. So I believe we can answer some questions if you have some. We have some time left. So just to finish it, you know, because it was quite quite technical for you guys. I see that not 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 everyone understands exactly what's happening. But what's important here is that in the end for the business it's very it's, it's very important for you. Because when you want when you can just create a system which is which is which is disposable. So you can basically set it up in different instances whenever you want. 
So you can set up the system on the client side, on your side, on another client side. And we are actually, we actually had the challenge not saying Drupal during this presentation because Drupal is one of the things we, we deploy using, using this, using that. Um, and uh, Alexander mentioned that when everything is in the code, it becomes very, it becomes simple because even developer can understand what's happening. And on our side, when we create and just when we're working on Drupal project, uh, we have lots of them in IDX. So each project itself defines its deployment pipelines. So each developer can actually access and write what's happening when my project is deployed. It's probably just uh, clearing caches or probably launching some important and complex operation. Uh, and uh, everything, as he said, starts from the, from the top to the bottom. So everything inside the code. The system itself is inside the code and each project itself s explains itself in the code. So if there, are, if there are no questions, we can answer, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's, we usually, we usually do this, we can, as Jenkins is running inside the container, we, the, the, whole, the part which is data in Jenkins is in separate data container, so we can actually destroy Jenkins whenever we want and rest, rest it up it again. Uh, with the new version, and then of course it will going to launch the upgrade process of Jenkins. So when 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 everything is separated properly, you can you can store your important data in one place, and your configuration, your uh, infrastructure is in another place. That's like a main idea of the system to be able to destroy it, uh, and then set it up again without losing your data. Because of course you want to have your logs in Jenkins. You want to know what actually happened. What are the, where are the logs, etc. Uh, that's, it can be automate, autom automated, yes, uh, but we prefer to do it manually because of uh, uh, how, to, how to say that. We are in open source world, right? Uh, Drupal itself, when you update it from 8.2 to 8.3, if your project is complicated, it can create troubles, right? So I think most of the people here already encountered that. Uh, so it's kind of the same. So we, c we are able to automate that. On the, on the system level, but uh, we can we consider it too dangerous to to do this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah in the end, that's you need to start it somewhere. So you create a route, and then if you want to dispose it, you don't need it anymore because you can set it up on other servers. That's that's a good question. The backups. Um, can yeah, on one one on one of the projects we actually store it in the in Amazon S3. We create uh, backups of the data containers and store it there. It's uh, something that we we do, we are not doing it a lot uh, because as we said that's that's mostly. The system is quite complicated, so the, it's for the corporate clients, and they have their own usually system of backing up things. So we try to plug it, plug in external, external system of backup. And if we do it by ourselves, we do, we use Amazon S3. Any question? Okay, so thank you very much, guys.